Hello and welcome to Veterinary Instrumentation's latest episode of Under the Skin, a videography series introducing key devices and techniques used during orthopaedic surgery. In this episode, we are looking at three procedures commonly performed to correct medial patella luxation. Block recession sulcoplasty, wedge recession sulcoplasty and tibial tuberosity transposition. So, let's go under the skin. The patella is part of the quadriceps mechanism. It tracks along the femoral trochlear sulcus and functions to direct the proximal force of the muscle, causing the stifle to extend. If there is malalignment of the quadriceps mechanism relative to the femoral trochlea, the likelihood of patella luxation increases. A number of different factors, usually developmental, can affect the alignment of the quadriceps mechanism and result in patella luxation. Medial patella luxation is more common than lateral luxation. Mild cases may be managed non-surgically but most commonly, when surgery is indicated, techniques are employed to either deepen the trochlear sulcus, transpose the tibial tuberosity to a more normal position, or both. Block recession sulcoplasty is technically the more difficult to perform of the femoral sulcoplasty techniques, but allows for creation of a deeper trochlear groove and optimal preservation of the articular cartilage. A medial parapatella skin incision is made. The dissection is extended through the medial retinaculum, medial joint capsule, and medial patella femoral ligament. This allows the patella to be luxated laterally and a subjective examination of the trochlear groove is made. The caudal aspect of the patella should also be inspected for damage to the articular cartilage. A modular osteotome blade is chosen that best fits the maximum width of the trochlear groove. This will determine the width of the intended sulcoplasty. A number 11 scalpel blade is used to gently score the intended cut position on the medial and lateral trochlear ridges. These should be positioned such that there is sufficient ridge width remaining, but that the block will be as wide as possible. A fine-toothed hand saw is then used to create the sagittal, lateral and medial cuts that will define the edges of the osteochondral block. The base of both cuts must be flat and at the same level. An osteotome and mallet are used to cut the base of the block. A modular osteotome is recommended as the blades are thin, which reduces the chance of fracturing the block. Pre-placing a K-wire can help to guide the osteotome, avoiding going too deep, and avoiding going too superficial, which can cause the block to fracture. The base of the block is cut from distal to proximal. The starting point is just cranial to the intercondylar notch, and the finishing point is the osteochondral junction of the trochlear groove proximally. Once the osteotomy is complete, the osteochondral block is carefully removed from the femur. Recessing the block is achieved by either removal of subchondral bone from the base of the block, by removal of exposed subchondral bone from the base of the recess, or a combination of both. The subchondral bone surface must be smooth and flat, so removal is best achieved either with the modular osteotome or a rectangular bone rasp. The osteochondral block is then repositioned in the graft site. Fit, stability and depth of recession are reviewed and adjustments made as necessary. If the block is loose, Pledgets of excised subchondral bone can be used to wedge the block stable between the trochlear ridges and the osteochondral graft.
wedge recession sulcoplasty is technically easier than block recession, but it preserves much less articular cartilage and does not deepen the trochlear sulcus as effectively as block sulcoplasty. A medial parapatellar skin incision is made. The dissection is extended through the medial retinaculum, medial joint capsule, and medial patellar femoral ligament. This allows the patella to be luxated laterally and a subjective examination of the trochlear groove is made. The caudal aspect of the patella should also be inspected for damage to the articular cartilage. A number 11 scalpel blade is used to score the highest points of the medial and lateral trochlear ridges. The score marks are used as a guide for creating an osteochondral wedge using a fine-toothed handsaw. The lateral and medial saw cuts should be oriented obliquely to meet just cranial to the intercondylar notch of the femur distally and at the osteochondral junction proximally. Once the cuts are completed, the osteochondral wedge is carefully removed from the femur. Recessing the wedge is usually achieved by making a further cut to remove more bone from either the medial or lateral exposed trochlear sulcus. Alternatively, a thin slice of bone may be removed from the wedge itself, but this is much fiddlier and more difficult and will result in loss of articular cartilage. If necessary, subchondral bone can be removed from the apex of the wedge using rongeurs to improve fit and stability. The osteochondral wedge is then repositioned in the graft site. Fit, stability and depth of recession are reviewed and adjustments made as necessary. The patient is placed in dorsal recumbency and the alignment of the quadriceps mechanism is visually assessed. Sharp dissection is performed to expose the medial aspect of the tibial tuberosity. An incomplete osteotomy of the tibial tuberosity is performed according to preoperative planning. Proximally, the osteotomy should start just cranial to Gerdes tubercle. The osteotomy should not be too narrow this is to avoid the risk of tibial tuberosity fracture. Distally, a bridge of intact cortical bone and periosteum is maintained at the distal margin of the tibial crest. The cranial caudal depth of the osteotomized tibial tuberosity should be approximately one third of the overall craniocaudal depth of the tibia at the point of insertion of the patella tendon. The proximal tibial tuberosity is now mobile in the medial lateral plane, but the distal aspect remains attached. Using a periosteal elevator, the tibial tuberosity is gently and carefully transposed laterally into a position that achieves neutral orientation of the quadriceps mechanism and reliable tracking of the patella through full range of stifle movement. Two arthrodesis wires are driven into the proximal tibial tuberosity to immobilize it in its new laterally transposed position. Positioning for the arthrodesis wires should be just proximal to the distal insertion point of the patella ligament to avoid creation of a stress riser. They should be directed slightly craniolateral to chordomedial and away from the stifle joint. The arthrodesis wires are best positioned side by side, or one may be placed distal to the other. Placement of a figure of eight tension band wire is strongly advised. The whole positioning for the tension band wire should be just caudal to the cranial tibial cortex and equidistant from the distal aspect of the osteotomy, the purple line, as the insertion point of the K wires, the turquoise line. The figure of eight tension band can be made from one or two pieces of orthopedic wire. The crossing point of the figure of eight wires should ideally lie over the tibial tuberosity, not distal to it.
using two wire twisters simultaneously to tighten the tension band will assist in achieving even tension. Ensure the wires twist around each other, not one around the other. The figure of eight tension band should be completed with a lateral and a medial twist that are cut to length and bent over alongside the tibial tuberosity to ensure no interference with soft tissues. The K wires are bent proximally cut down to an appropriate length and twisted to a position where they do not interfere with the soft tissues. Once the tibial tuberosity transposition procedure is completed, patella stability is further tested through a full extensive range of stifle movement. For further information on the VI range of instruments and implants for patella luxation surgery and to view a comprehensive surgery guide on this procedure, please visit our website or contact our specialist technical support team. Join our online community by following our social media pages, keeping up to date with the latest releases of training and education material, as well as company updates.